morning, everybody. How are you doing? That well. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it is kind of a sad morning. It's the last day of Dreamforce, but that just means that you've learned a whole lot, you've had a lot of fun, and uh, you still have a day to do more learning. So we're going to get right into it. Today's session is about integrating third-party APIs using Apex RESTful callouts. So I'm sure you've seen this screen before. I'm not going to do too much talking about it. You know what it is, safe harbor. So my name is Jenna Tucker, and I am the marketing representative here today with MK Partners. We are a cloud consulting firm based in LA. Actually, proud to say the second most experienced consulting partner on the App Exchange. Um, and with me today is our chief technology officer, Matt Kaufman. So show of hands. Have any of you ever wanted to pull outside data automatically into Salesforce? Perfect, you're in the right session then. So today, your mission is to integrate the force.com platform with the Stack Exchange. You're all here, so I'm guessing that means that you accept this mission. So I'm going to give you a little overview of what you're getting yourself into. Uh, Matt's going to give you some more information on RESTful callouts. Then he's going to write Apex code to perform callouts. And that response is going to be transformed into a usable format. Next, a visual force will be created, which is going to display that data on the force.com with the force.com look and feel that we all know and love. Afterwards, Matt will write some test coverage, and then he'll perform a mock callout to uh, better test the code and validate the logic. So without further ado, I'm going to throw it over to Matt, and uh, he'll get started. Thanks, Jenna. So before we start, I want to give some, some background information, make sure we're all on the same page. We're going to talk about uh, RESTful callouts. And REST, for those of you that don't know, it's represent representational state transfer. It's basically the way that web servers talk to each other. Um, typically, that information is going to be passed as HTML, maybe XML. Today, we're going to be looking at JSON. Um, and what this does, it allows two web servers, regardless of how they're built, whether they're built on Java, or .NET, PHP, doesn't matter. They can communicate with each other using this format. Um, JSON is uh, a little less rigid than, say, XML. Maybe you're familiar with XML. Um, JSON typically is going to be a faster way to transfer data, um, and it's not as structured. And as we'll see today, Apex makes it really, really, really easy to work with JSON strings. So if you've looked at stuff before, you say, like, oh, I don't know what to do. After today, it's going to be so much easier. This is a high-level overview of what's happening when we do a callout from Apex to a third-party web service. You see on the left, we have the force.com platform. We're going to do a call out over the internet to this other server somewhere. It's going to receive that message, do whatever it needs to do, and then pass back some response. Uh, this could be used for processing credit cards, um, maybe validating data. You could validate addresses, uh, or even augmenting data or bringing new data into the force.com platform. Built into Apex, we have an HTTP request class, an HTTP class, and an HTTP response class. Um, and then, like I said, we're going to use the JSON class to also work with the body of that request, that body of that callout, to very easily transform it from something that's not really human readable to something that is human readable. Now, before you do any callouts, you're going to have to create a remote site setting. And what this is doing is, it's, I'm going to jump back to, uh, to Chrome right now. What we're doing is we're saying, this is a URL that we're going to allow our code to contact. And we're going to allow it to, to talk to. And it's a very specific URL. You can't whitelist a whole domain. You can't whitelist a whole directory. So you can see here, this one's HTTP, this one's HTTPS. That's how specific it is. And this is so some rogue developer at your companies can't go in and write some code to send information outside without someone coming here and whitelisting it. So this is the very first step you want to do. You want to find your endpoint. Go ahead and create a remote site setting in setup. OK. So let's start with the HTTP request class. So this is a way in Apex for us to create an object that defines what we're trying to do. We're trying to call a specific URL. We're going to say uh, that we're doing a get or a post or a put. These are called verbs. Um, and we use the set method method to specify which verb we're doing. Um, we also can set a body of a message. So maybe we're saying, hey, outside server, here's the information that you need. And we put that in the body. There's also headers. There's timeouts, all sorts of other attributes that we'll look at also. But this defines what the platform should be doing when it goes to talk to that other server. The HTTP class, simplest class to use in Apex. It has one thing and one thing only. It's a method called send. The input for that method is your HTTP request. 
And as a result of calling that method, you get an HTTP response. That's it. There's nothing else to do. Really easy. And finally, there's the HTTP response class. So this is that message that came back from that other web service. And the platform's going to translate that into an Apex object that you can work with inside your code. And so we can get the status of that message. What, was it received OK? We can get a status code. Typically, if you're 200 to 299, that's a good code. That means it was received successfully. If you're outside of that range, there's probably some type of error. And to find out what that error means, you would reference the documentation for that web service. Um, there's also get body. So again, if we're asking that other web service for information, all that information that it's giving us is going to be inside that body. So we can work with this just like any other object inside Apex. What I like to do now that I know, OK, HTTP request HTTP and HTTP response, I like to create a single method that I can use over and over again to perform all these operations on this third-party server. And so I'm going to jump to Sublime here. One second while we do it. There we go. And I have a class. And inside that class, I have a single method, like I said, called callout. And the inputs for that method are the verb, the HTTP method that we're doing here. Again, post, put get, et cetera. You can see they're listed there. The endpoint, so what's the URL of this server that we're hitting? And then the body of the message that we're sending to that server. And the body is sometimes optional. If you're doing a get where you're basically just looking at a page, you typically don't send a body. And so you'll see here I have, if it's not blank, go ahead, pass it in, and set the length. Otherwise, let's just ignore it. So this one method I can use over and over regardless of what I'm trying to do. Whether I'm getting information, sending information, updating information, I could use this one method over and over. And what you'll probably do when you get home, or even maybe later today, you'll create a method like this too. And then maybe you'll even start adding stuff. Sometimes I like to add a map of header keys and things like that, because I want to use it across different web services. And each web service is going to have different requirements. Some are going to say, oh, we want this header. Other web services say, we want this other web server. You might have to pass in a certificate or credentials. So you might expand this a little more. But this is a simple one that will work for today's demo. All of these, this code is available too on a GitHub repo, so you don't necessarily have to take pictures if you just want to enjoy. <laughs> OK, so we have our method. We're going to do a callout. And we're going to see the result of that callout is going to be a response body. And that response body typically is not human readable. It's usually a lot of information. If it's XML, at least it's structured. You can see where things start and where things end. But when it's JSON and it's complex, it's really easy to lose your way and forget where am I. Am I inside the list? Am I inside an item in that list? Am I inside a list that's part of that item? And so on and so forth. And so what I'm going to do is, uh, again, jump back to Maven's Mate. And uh, we're going to go ahead and, and do this call out. Uh, we're going to call uh, that method. Oh, sorry. And see the result of it. And so I'm just going to come here. I'm going to say stack exchange API. And in this case, I, I kind of have a little helper method set up for me because uh, we weren't sure if internet would be great today. Um, so let's just come here and say questions unanswered. And you know, I'll even jump a little further and just show you the result right here. So this is a, a page we're going to look at in a minute, but it'll be a little faster to look at here. So this is a JSON string. And you can see it's not easy to look at. But there are tools on the web, such as JSON Pretty Print, that will allow you to see that string a little more easily. And you can see here, this is a little more human readable, but it's still not great. You wouldn't have an end user work with something like this. And to figure out what all this stuff is, we would go to the documentation for that web service. And it'll tell us. It'll say, OK, when you make a call, here's what you're going to get back. You're going to get back a list of questions. And inside that question, there's going to be certain attributes and so on and so forth. And so if we look at this first URL here, the Stack Exchange API, I have it up already. You can see the definition of one of their questions. So when we're talking about a question on their API, there's going to be a, an integer for accepted answer ID. There's going to be an integer for answer count, and so on and so forth. There's the body, all this stuff here is the definition of what they call a question. And then if we come down a little further, you can see this is the JSON representation of that same question. This looks a lot like the result of that query that I did, because it is. So 
So once we understand what it is we're supposed to be getting back, we have this definition, we know all the different attributes that we're interested in, all we have to do is start coding that in Apex. And when we do that, we'll be able to then use this JSON class to serialize and deserialize the JSON strings into Apex objects. So we're going to define this object. It's going to be just a class inside Apex. It's going to have attributes, strings, integers, booleans, etc. And using this one class, this one method, we can convert a long JSON string that looks like that gobbledygook into a nice instance of an object or an instance of multiple objects. And then once we have that, if we wanted to change it back into a string to send it somewhere else, we just use the serialize method to change it back into a string. So we can go back and forth. And in today's demo, we're going to use both, deserialize and serialize. So let's jump back here and look at this class that I've set up. If we scroll down a little higher, scroll up a little higher, we can see here's the response resource that I've created. So this is going to be the body that comes back from this API. We're calling the API to get questions in this case from Stack Exchange. And the overarching object that comes back is called the response resource. Inside that response resource is going to be a list of items we can see here. And each one of those items is actually an instance of this question resource. And when we were looking at the web page, there was a long list of attributes. But I'm only interested in some of them. And that JSON serialize and deserialize methods, they'll accept if you just want some. It doesn't have to be perfect. It's not like XML where it has to be an exact match. So if you're only interested in five of the 20, that's fine. It'll only give you the five of the 20. One day you decide you want the sixth one, you add the sixth attribute right here, boom, now you get the sixth one. So it's really great methods. I highly encourage using it. Once you've done it, you'll never look back. Um, we went a little further. One of the attributes of the question resource is actually another object as well. Uh, the owner, the person who posts that question. And so we define that user resource here. So we're actually working with three different objects. And we'll have a list of the question resource. Each question resource will have an, a user resource. This is really hard to look at as a human. It's also kind of hard to display because it's multiple dimensions. But what we're going to do to make this easier is create a Visual Force page that will display this information. And the goal here is to create a Visual Force page that looks just like any other page on the platform so that our end users know exactly what to do with it. They'll understand, oh, this is just like a list view. Very easy. So we're going to create a controller for this page, and then we're going to create the markup on the Visual Force page. And we're going to leverage the existing code that we wrote to do a call out and the existing objects that we defined in our inner classes. I'm going to just jump to Sublime and show you the actual code. It'll be a little easier. So here's our controller. And you can see here I went ahead and added a little extra for today's demo. Basically, we're, we're defining the endpoint ahead of time. You probably would you know, define the endpoint as you go to the page. Here, when we do our callout, we're not rewriting the code. We're just leveraging that same callout method that I created before, passing in the method. So in this case, we're doing a get. Passing in the endpoint. In this case, it's the endpoint to get questions that are related to Salesforce. Um, and then there is no request body in this case, because we're, we're doing a get, so there's no request body. Um, and then we're just going to get the status, the status code, and the body, and we're going to display that on the screen. And so I have these properties at the top that allow me to display this information easily on the screen. Um, you can see here, then we go and deserialize those questions. So what we're going to do is we're going to take that response body, and we're going to say, based on the documentation, I know this should be an instance of the response resource. So we're going to go ahead and deserialize it and cast it as an instance of that response resource. And I'm only interested in the list of questions. So in this case, we're going to go ahead and display that list of questions here. You can see up here I've defined it as a list of that inner class. Um, and then we just have a getter to help us with selecting a method. So this is the, the uh, controller. If we go to the page itself, the markup is pretty simple. It looks just like any other Visual Force page. We've got an Apex, Apex page block table down below. And this is going to allow us to loop through all those questions and display the attributes of, of those questions, just like we would if it was a list of cases or tasks or ideas or anything else inside uh, Salesforce. And so you can see here we're referencing the different attributes of those question records. All right, so let's take you to the page again. And so this is the page. It's basically it's a tester for callouts. Because we've whitelisted the Stack Exchange API URL, we can test it with that URL. If we were to type in some other URL in here, we'll get an exception saying we need to create a remote site setting for it. And again, for the purpose of today's demo, I'm, I'm pre-filling in the URL, but you could come up with some other way to fill it in. So when I do a callout, we're calling out from the platform to the Stack Exchange API. 
And the result of that is going to have a status code of 200, which again in that range is good. Um, status that they sent back to us is OK. That's, that's good. OK is a good thing. Um, and then here's the body. Again, it's, it's a big JSON text. It's hard to read. Um, so we need to take this a step further. We need to do that deserialize method. I'm going to go ahead and deserialize it. And here is that list. So this long string here actually corresponds to this list of objects right here. You can see here I posted a question just a couple minutes ago. Is there an existing toolkit to integrate with force.com with Stack Exchange? The answer is going to be yes. And you all have that link to it at the end of the slides. So this looks to me like any other list view. If we wanted to, we could take this a step further, have a create case button, or even respond inline from the screen and never actually create the data inside the platform. So we can interact with this external data just using these web services. So now that we have our code working, everyone's happy. But we can't actually deploy this to production yet. So if you're here, you're probably familiar with this already. In order to deploy code, we need 75% coverage of all of the code that we just wrote, minimum 75%, ideally more. And ideally, they're meaningful tests and things like that. And when it comes to callouts, that's really difficult. Because how can you do a meaningful test of a callout without actually doing that callout? And you never would want to actually do the callout, because imagine we were processing credit cards here. How do you call up your customer and say, yeah, sorry about that charge. We were just testing the server, making sure our code works. Not a good idea. So Apex actually prevents you from ever doing a callout inside a test method. And so if you try to do this and you were to run your tests, you'd probably get very low test coverage, because you'll get a message saying, oh, sorry, we can't do that for you. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to come here and run my tests again. Let me make sure that I comment out one line before I do that. Perfect, we have it commented out. I'm going to run the tests. And right now, we're going to actually try to do the call out. The platform's going to say, no, 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 no. We don't let you do that. And I only get 8% coverage. So right away, I'm in trouble. I cannot deploy. And if you've ever been in this situation, you're probably sweating. You're like, I'm going to be up all night trying to figure this out, make up some extra code. I don't know what you're going to do. But fortunately, we have a solution. So let's go back to Sublime, and we'll see what's happening here. In our test method, we're actually trying to do the call out right there. And that's a problem. Now, in the old days, what we used to do we do something like this. We say, well, if we're running a test, go ahead. Actually, we'd say if we're not running a test. Go ahead and do it. And so now our code will, will work properly when we're not running a test. It'll work for all of our end users. But when it comes time to testing, we're not going to get a meaningful test because we're not actually going through any of the motions that occur after doing that call out. We're not testing to make sure that the result that we get back, the response, is properly parsed and that we're able to work with it. So it's really not a meaningful test. It's not a good idea. And this is what we used to do. And so the people at Salesforce said, well, there's got to be a better way. And so they came up with this idea of doing a mock callout. Let me just undo this because it's not a good idea. All right. So a mock callout is basically a mock web service that you write to do the exact same thing that the real third-party web service does. And so it's going to receive a request, do whatever it needs to do, and then send back a response. And then after all the work that we've already done, it's really easy to use this interface. So I'm going to pull up this class, this mock callout here. And what you'll see, we start by getting the request, one method, very easy. And here what we're doing is we're creating an instance of that response resource. That same resource that we were going to cast to, the real response, we're going to now do the flip and do the reverse. So we're going to go ahead and create an instance of it, create a list of items, start populating that list with fake data. And here we even set the owner. And then finally, we set the status. We set the status code and set the body. And we're going to use that serialize method when we set the body. So we're going to take this instance of an object, turn it into one long JSON string, and pass it back as if we were the real web service. So this allows us to do a meaningful test where we're actually testing the real response that we would have gotten had we done a real call out. Now, again, if you want, you could just copy and paste the real response, put it in there, return it as a text string. That's fine. Um, but I like to go through the motion so we can really test our business. So once we have this set up, if I come back to my tests, I can specify that this is the mock that we want to use. And we, we do that with the test.setMock method. It allows us to pass in an instance of this class. Just waiting for it to save, and then I'll rerun my test. We'll see how much more test coverage we have. So let's go ahead and rerun these tests. OK, so it passed. Great. Let's check the class coverage. 
almost 100% across the board. There's one line that I couldn't get. But now we have meaningful tests, we have plenty of test coverage, and I'm able to deploy to production. So on a high level, here's what's happening when we run our test. Instead of going out to the internet and calling this other web service and saying, I'm calling you, but it's not for real, please don't take it you know, seriously, we're just going to stay inside the platform and call this mock callout, this interface that we set up instead. And the response, you set up, so you can code it to be exactly what you want. You can make it dynamic and say, well, if the request has an endpoint of X, pass back this response. And if it's an endpoint of Y, pass back this other response. Or actually analyze the body of the request. You can do all sorts of logic there if you want to. Again, you use the set mock method. If you don't do that, you're still in the same place that you were before, and you're not going to get enough coverage. You can use the set mock method multiple times if you need to. You can set up multiple mock interfaces if you want as well. So you can test different web services. You don't have to have a single uh, interface. So Jenna, how'd I do? Matt, such a good job, uh, which is actually what we like to do for our clients at MK Partners. As I mentioned before, um, we are located in Los Angeles. We've been a Salesforce consulting partner since 2006, actually the second most experienced partner on the App Exchange with nearly 600 completed projects and a 98% customer satisfaction rating um, from an independent survey done by salesforce.com. When it comes to clients, we work with people of various sizes, various industries. Um, you can find us on the app exchange, of course. And when it comes to integrating force.com, as you'll see from this giant list, <laughs> Uh, it's something that we do frequently. You'll notice a lot of names that you're probably familiar with, Amazon.com, Facebook, Google, uh, Twitter, and a whole lot more. So that is why we're here today and Matt is giving this presentation. But that's going to do it for us. Again, we want to thank you all for checking out our presentation. And if anybody has any questions, um, we have some time. So we're willing to take those. So uh, this deck will be available online as well. And the... Uh the code that we work with today is also available on this repo. We'll probably upload a, a slightly newer version after the presentation. But if there's any questions, like Jenna said, please come up and use the mic. So just a quick question about the JSON deserializer. Um, if, if it doesn't map to a property, does it... Oh, sorry. Does it, if it doesn't map to a property, the JSON deserializer, does it uh, throw an exception or does it just pass in a null or what does it do? So if the JSON string that comes back as part of your response has an attribute that you didn't define, it just ignores it. Okay. Yeah. And if it's the wrong data type, it just ignores it too? Uh, if it's the wrong data type, you'll probably get an exception. Okay. Yeah. All right. Just ignores it and then does it just set it to null if it's... No, it's as if it didn't come in. So if you don't define the attribute inside your um, inner class or outer class, whatever you want to do. Um, so if you don't define the attribute here, let's say there's an attribute called um, answer. answer type. Oh, right. We didn't define it. It's just going to ignore it. We can't reference it. Okay. And you do so if we, wanted, if we wanted to work with it, we'd have to add something that called answer type. And now we could work with it. Now, if the response doesn't include it, yeah, that's then it would set it to null. Yeah. It would set it to null. Okay. Yeah, yeah that's a question. Cool. Thank you. Good question. In the back. Hi there. When you set the mock interface, are you allowed to set multiple mock interfaces or only one? So you can set multiple ones, but it's the last one that you set that's going to be used. OK, that was, that was right. going to be my so, question. So okay. you would probably create multiple unit tests then if you needed to test different interfaces. But you could also be clever. And when you get to your mock interface, the first thing I typically do is I evaluate, OK, well, what's going on here? Did we hit the endpoint for questions, or did we hit the endpoint for answers? And based on that, I'm going to respond differently. Excellent. Thank you. No problem. Anyone else? Anybody else? All right. OK. <laughs> well, thank you, everyone. If you did have a question you didn't feel comfortable asking, we can stick around a little as well. Yeah.